Good evening. You are with Attorney Talib Kareem, the CEO of STEM for Us, also known as STEM for US. And we're happy to be here on this historic day, the first full day of office for our new president and vice president, uh, including uh, none other than Kamala Harris, a Howard University alumni, HU, for all of those who know the response, we'll see in the comments section if you do, uh, just uh, add it. And of course, if you um, do uh, know the response, uh, please go ahead and put it there in the comment section. Also, if you haven't already uh, liked this conversation and hit, smack that uh, subscribe button so you can get all the latest updates for our series uh, and our conversations on outstanding leaders in STEM. And I'm excited to have today a, a leader in STEM, someone who deals with the issue of science, technology, engineering, and math every single day, um, and who is really pivotal to probably uh, many of us who order things online. And that is uh, my buddy from um, <laughs> my buddy from from my days uh, as a cadet at the United States Air Force Academy, uh, and someone who has matriculated uh, to now becoming one of our nation's top pilots, uh, flying uh, for a large commercial um, delivery company, and also training other pilots. Uh, or you know, aspiring pilots as the director of the Solo Flight Academy for the Organization of Black uh, Aerospace Professionals, also known as OBAP. So without any further ado, let me introduce the incomparable, the dynamic, the brilliant Jeffrey Jeff Harrison from Prince George's County. No, no, not Prince George's County, Anne Arundel County. Am I am I right or wrong? Yes, sir. Anne Arundel. Anne Arundel County. First of all, where are you um, logging into us from currently, uh, Captain Jeffrey Harrison? Well, uh, unfortunately, my job takes me on the road. I'm actually in uh, Calgary, Alberta, Canada. Canada. Now, it, it's a little bit chilly out here in Washington, D.C., where I, I'm, I'm based or right outside of Washington. Um, but is is it cold there in Calgary? Yes, it's actually uh, when I landed, it was minus seven. Minus seven. <laughs> it was minus seven uh, when oh. I landed this morning. Uh, but we don't go through the temperature extremes that you all have been uh, recently because it was minus 45 yesterday. Now it's plus 46 is what I hear. Plus 46. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Well, uh, I don't know anything about minus 45s where where it might be minus 45 uh, in, in this case. President. <laughs> I'm going in the inbound. <laughs> I, I, I can definitely tell you, though, that it, it, it was a little bit, um, you know, it was a, a bright day today, I must say. It was a, a nice, um, not warm, but definitely not chilly as it was yesterday and during the inauguration. Um, I think the temperatures had um, had dipped to a point of like, you know, in the 20s or something like that, which could have accounted for why there weren't any protests. <laughs> Maybe it was too cold for folks to come on out. You know what I mean? <laughs> but uh, I am very glad to, um, to to have you with us. How is your 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 family? First of all, um, Jeff, I, I pray. I know we're in a, a pandemic and we can't take anything for granted. But how are you and your family doing? Everybody's great. Uh, obviously, the pandemic has impacted everybody's uh, households and communities, uh, and we're doing the best we can to stay safe, uh, masking up uh, when we go outside, as well as hand sanitizer. So uh, I don't think I can move inside of six feet without seeing a spare mask or hand sanitizer. Now, you know, I want to, I have a lot of questions for you because, you know, you are a pilot. Um, and um, these days, 
uh, I have not been on an airplane since last December, you know, and and I mean, just the whole idea and the notion of uh, flying these days um, is is a bit, you know, of a challenge for me, um, you know, as it is for millions of other Americans. So I, I really am looking forward to di diving into, you know, what you do and how you do it, particularly in this pandemic. But before we do that, I'd like to really just kind of you know, uh, go back down memory lane, as our father used to say. <laughs> back down memory lane. You don't know nothing about that. You don't know nothing about Minnie that. Minnie Ripperton. Uh-oh, uh -oh, uh -oh. Man, Minnie Ripperton, boy, I heard once, and just as an aside, she came and performed at Howard's Crampton um, Auditorium, man, and turned it out, man. And uh, one of my mentors, actually, at Howard, uh, interviewed her for the student newspaper, man. He was just telling me about how amazing she was. And I did not know how many, you know, tunes actually came from Minnie Ripperton, man. You know what I mean? Um, it, it, again, just talk about kind of hidden gems, you know, like you, you know, a hidden gem, you know, and I look forward to, to uncovering that gem uh, a little bit for all the parents and all of the um, educators out here who are working every day to, to, to motivate our young people. And I see one of our buddies, T Money Todd Stewart has um, you know chimed in. We appreciate you, T Money. And again, we encourage and invite all of our um, our colleagues and our, our friends and family. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to, to put it into the uh, comment box, and we try to get that question answered. But tell me uh, about your story. Um, where did you start off uh, in high school, and, um, and and how did you find yourself um, you know at the uh, Air Force Academy? Uh, it's kind of uh, a crazy story. So I grew up on a farm. I'm number seven of three children. Uh, uh, my father was a janitor. Uh, he lost both of his parents. I, I know that we've had conversations. You lost your parents when they were young. My father lost both of his parents before he turned 13. So he ended up having to drop out of high school uh, to support the family. Uh, so his uh, education level stopped somewhere maybe in eighth or ninth grade uh, level, uh, but he he was adamant that he wanted a better life for his kids. So he self-taught himself algebra and calculus, the whole nine, uh, still worked the custodian job. Uh, my mom was an educator, so she started as a uh, uh, English teacher uh, and uh, Back in those days, money was very tight, especially uh, for a family of eight. Uh, they scrimped uh, enough money. And uh, for the students that out there, you probably don't know about it, but the Encyclopedia Britannica, uh, they bought a set of uh, encyclopedias. Uh, I think it was around 1970 or 1972. Uh, and that was our library, if you will. So uh, before we could go out, we had to read a story and write a summary of what we read uh, to to their standards. To go out and I want to I want to chime in there, brother, because I know exactly of what you speak in terms of those Britannica, uh, you know, uh, encyclopedias, man. And, and people don't realize, you know, my children would probably, you know, uh, laugh, but we bought our uh, our uh, encyclopedias from the salesman who came to the door and sold us. Uh, those encyclopedia view that would, that would totally be foreign, you know, to think about selling buying some encyclopedias from somebody, you know what I mean, on the on the doorstep. But that's how they came to us, man. And we, as you said, we used to do you know, uh, book reports on those uh, those pages, man. I mean, almost, I mean, daily, non stop, man. That is in the in the encyclopedias world, like our our internet. You know, we learned so Absolutely. much about life through those uh, encyclopedias. Let me build on that a little bit, brother. I'm sorry to cut it, you off. There. It, no, it's it, exactly there. So they're still at my mom's house, uh, relics in, in her uh, uh, book closet, as we call it. But uh, yes, that was our source of uh, study material. Uh, so as much as 1972 gave us, that's as much I could put in the report that I did at home because there was no internet. Uh, so back to that. Uh, seven of eight, uh, the preceding kids, 
uh, four of which to college. And by the time it came to me, uh, money was kind of scarce, uh, especially with the uh, salary of the two parents. Uh, so I elected I wanted to go someplace whereas it would be free, but also advantageous in the long run. Uh, my best friend, which uh, we had a conversation about, John Jones, uh, uh, we went to the same high school. He ended up going to the Naval Academy. Uh, and then a couple of years before that, another buddy of ours, same high school, Harry Wingo, uh, went to the Naval Academy. So I said, well, I'm going to do something a little different. I'm going to go west. And I didn't know where the Air Force Academy was, but that's where I was going. It was a chance to try to play D1 basketball as well. Uh, I found out that my skill set was not uh, – conducive to the D1 level. So I became somewhat of a uh, player manager. So I sat at the end of the bench, uh, handing out towels, gums, uh, and mints. Uh, but- Hold on, hold on. You actually were a, a manager of the um, of the Academy's uh, basketball team? I, I knew you had a nice game, but I didn't know you were a manager of the, of the squad. Well, I, I, due to my lack of activity on the court, <laughs> I made myself a, a manager, but no, I wasn't the manager. I walked on the JV team. Uh, and then only time I really got to play was when we were down and it was in the uh, what we call them wasted minutes, garbage minutes, as they call them now, because I was not a recruit. So I was a walk on. So uh, did you did you go to the did you go to the, the prep school or did you come straight into the academy? No, well, I went to the prep school. Uh, some of the uh, people that you had on the panel before, uh, buddies of mine from 86. Uh, we all went to the prep school. Uh very tight bond. It was great. Uh, I called it 13th grade in the sense that you didn't lose any eligibility. Uh, and, uh, you didn't lose any eligibility. Sorry about that. Uh, and you had a chance to see what the academy was like. So I, uh, I walked on the basketball team there uh, and found out that uh, it was uh, – a, a good opportunity. I have to text my wife not to call me at the moment. I understand how that is. The queen says that she is uh, wanting to talk, but uh, and, 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 I, and Todd Stewart was saying uh, a squadron uh, at, at the at the prep school. If you know what that is, yeah. So I was in C squad. Uh, Sergeant Watkins uh, was B squad and then S Staff Sergeant Herrera was mine. Uh, and they kind of know that because uh, S Sergeant Watkins would look from the second story and tell you if your shoes were shine. Wow. OK. So if you didn't see his his image, you better be going back. Uh, but we had great uh, camaraderie, great friendships uh, and uh, long lasting. Uh, moved on to the academy. I walked on the JV team again, and uh, uh, that's where I was handing out the gum, <laughs> towels, and that stuff. So uh, the other folks, like T Money, you mentioned, uh, my skill set was not uh, to that level. Uh, so I became what they called an inter intramural uh, uh, athlete, uh, intramural. So uh, that's where we were. So you either did intercollegiate or intramural at the academy. Uh, and that's where I was. Uh, while there, uh, I wanted to be uh, an electro engineer. So uh, we kind of talked Howard University with the vice president, uh, Harris. She graduated in 86. My sister actually graduated from Howard uh, in a, with a chemical engineering degree, also in 86. Uh, what, what, was your, what was your sister's name? Uh, well, Sheila is. Sheila. I mean, Sheila, <laughs> Sheila Harrison? Well, married name Riggs, but yes, she worked in the Department okay. of Navy. Uh, okay. So uh, she's. I may, have, I may have met her because we we know a lot of the um, engineering alumni from the '80s. And I, in fact, it's funny you mentioned '86, uh, Kamala Harris. Man, I did. I actually kind of, you know, in the back of my mind, knew she graduated back in the day, but. 86 is not that long ago, man. You know what I mean? I mean, it needs to be when I got on the yard, which was, you know, I got on the yard in 1990. So it was only about, you know, four years since she, she left the yard. Absolutely. Uh, so I had another sister that went to SMU. She went away uh, to school. So she's a mechanical engineer and she works for a large uh, company. Uh, 
based out of uh, an aerospace company based out of uh, the uh, Texas area. Uh, and so she designs uh, uh, missiles. Uh, it's great. Uh, so I said, hey, well, engineers seem to be running in the family. Let me try to put my hand in electrical engineering. Well, electrical engineering was pretty intense. So intense that I said, let me think about that. Uh, there's a better future for me. Uh, while we were out there, we got introduced to aviation. Never knew anybody that flew. Uh, we looked at the numbers at that time, and I think less than a half a percent of all the airline pilots in the world were African-American. So we said, what golden opportunity than we have right now than to go to uh, pilot training? So we encouraged everybody that was part of the Way of Life Committee uh, to put their name in the hat to uh, see if flying was their thing, their shtick. Uh, and we branched out in groups. So we had a support network. Uh, I ended up going through uh, Mississippi uh, with uh, two other brothers that uh, were in my class and uh, end up coming out on the winning side of getting a, a C-130. Uh, so I flew the C-130 for uh, active duty in uh, Texas, then moved to the schoolhouse. Uh, and then from there, I had a career shift, if you will. I found out that uh, I could do better things with my time uh, and have more availability by getting out of active duty and moving to the guard. Can, can we pause here, though, because I, I, you, you, you raised a couple of things that I want to um, I want to ask you about. And I, I guess one of the, thing, the things was the experience at the academy and getting into the um, the, you know, flight uh, program uh, and at the academy, you know that um, it is a it was a very challenging um, experience uh, in terms of being an African-American and not um, not all people got a chance to to make it to the to the flight uh, training. Um, tell us a little bit. And I think we have here a little, you know, image of yourself as a young 19 year old. And I Wow. From this image, brother, you actually don't look actually that much different than from where you look, where you are right now, man. You know, young dashing young man there on the edge, and you and you can see I I look like a little boy over there, all of about eighteen years old or so. <laughs> now I got all this gray hair, but but tell me, brother, I mean like memories. You know, uh, so pilot training. Uh, in order to go, you go through a pre-flight screening uh, and also a medical. So one, they want to see if you have the uh, skill set to do that. Uh, I would liken it to what you've seen in the Tuskegee Airmen movies, uh, where they were going through rigorous activities, uh, hand-eye coordination skill set, and then you also have the medical component, whereas uh, they want to make sure that your eyes are good, uh, your heart's good, uh, and that you can withstand the rigors of the training. Uh, so pre-flight screening that we did it there at the academy, uh, my first opportunity was flying in a sailplane, uh, which has no engine. It's really a glider, uh, in tow of a, uh, towed aircraft, have a rope in between. They drag you, you get airborne, you get aloft and you find thermals and sinks, uh, as far as the conductivity of radiation, uh, the K value uh, for those on the STEM side. Uh, fi figuring out where you can stay aloft longest. Uh, it was it was great. Uh, I'd never experienced anything like it. Uh, and you will always remember that. Uh, so put a pin on that, because then when I go to pilot training, now I actually have a motor in the engine and it's moving fast. So I have to think just as fast uh, and the, the saying is you always want to stay ahead of the jet. Uh, and that means think about what the next move is, not what just took place, because if that happens, then disaster could be abound. Uh, so uh, pilot training was was awesome in the sense that you learn uh, a plane in six months. And I call it about a phone book, both AK through LZ uh, worth of information. Uh, you start to master that and then they go, Okay, uh, time to move on to another plane. So 
you learn uh, another airplane. So I flew the 37 and 38s. Uh, one would be three miles uh, a minute, and the other one would be six miles a minute. Uh, so the speeding process of uh, what you're doing, we call that situational awareness. So your SA, for short, would have to increase, obviously. Uh, and that sets you up for the basic uh, mantra, uh, maintain aircraft control, analyze situation, take appropriate action, and land when conditions permit. Uh, and, and can you talk a, a little bit about, you know, speaking of, you know, situational uh, awareness, what was the situation as a black, um, first of all, a, a black student at the Air Force Academy who wanted to go to pilot training and then ultimately a, um, a black uh, junior officer who was in pilot training? How easy or intense uh, was that experience? So uh, I'll address the training itself. It's the most intense training I've ever been. Uh, if you could think of anything that you ever done uh, in life, uh, condense that to uh, uh, a six month course times two, so half and half, make a 12 month course. Uh, whereas if you're on a highway, uh, you'll have three exit ramps uh, before you get to your destination, uh, which is graduation. And those exit ramps will be bad rides. So if you mess up on one ride, they'll let you veer off, but you have to get back on the highway. Uh, and you only have two more chances at that point to get through. Uh, so a lot of folks dreaded the 87, 88, 89 type rides. Uh, and there are several ways that you can get there. Uh, air sickness, which I got there on one because uh, I was so busy looking out uh, the window, uh, just amazed at all the things I was seeing. Uh, what I didn't realize was, here's the science part, uh, your body uh, is adjusted to G's or gravitational forces through your otolith organs and vestibular glands. So much like a level that you've seen uh, when you hang a picture where you put the uh, beam or the, the bubble in the middle, as uh, far as coordinated, uh, that's the same thing that you'll have in flight. So uh, your body will sense acceleration uh, based on those gravitational forces. Uh, so to master that part, to make your eyes match what your brain uh, is encountering, uh, will put you in what they call a spatial disorientation, uh, which could lead to obviously incapacitation uh, blacking out from G's, uh, air sickness, which incapacitates you uh, from manipulating the controls, or just uh, confusion in the sense that you, you have no idea if you're right side up or inverted upside down. So I kind of talk like the pilots when they start shooting the watch, as they say. Uh, uh, that came with formation flying, and that was awesome. So consider yourself... Uh, a master uh, when you go through pilot training in the sense that you're relatively six to 10 feet away from another airplane and you're going through various maneuvers. Uh, uh, it's pretty cool. That, that's the best thing I can say. So they, they, you, but, but, uh, tell me a little bit about, because in my understanding, I, I at the Academy went through, um, went through j the jump school where I graduated from the parachute training program and it was i remember the first time people would talk about you know going through um you know again jump training i was like well why would i want to go and learn how to jump out of an airplane I, hopefully i'll never have to jump out of an airplane <laughs> you know but what you know i think it was stacy hawkins and a couple other buddies who had convinced me to get in uh, and go ahead and, and sign up but it was so intense because there was a essentially an understanding that there weren't that many black uh, graduates of the jump program. So of all the uh, cadets on the on the on the yard, if you will, not many of them who were black had those jump, you know, badges on. And so I understand that getting through the pilot training program 
is actually even more intense for a black student, um, you know, a black trainee, black junior uh, officer. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes, sir. So the first thing we always say is why well, jump out of perfectly good aircraft, especially if you got the engines rolling, uh, because then you lose the asset uh, and then you lose your credibility as a pilot as well. In a, in a certain sense, behind closed doors, as the joke would say. Uh, but sometimes you have to disable the jet uh, uh, and take it away from crowded source. Uh, when you look at the demographics, uh, the disparity that was in 1960s, so when uh, the Tuskegee Airmen folks went to war and came back and couldn't get jobs, uh, that same ratio, uh, and I want to say it was like, uh, I forget the number, but it, it'll be less than uh, 4% of the pilots uh, that were in there were African-American. That number in 1960 is the same relationship that we have today. So when you start thinking of progress, uh, you start thinking of uh, uh, doors and opportunities. Uh, a lot of us aren't gravitating to that career field simply because one, they don't know anybody in there, typically is what happens in there. Two, uh, marketing has not really done its best job to put forth. So here comes uh, groups kind of like what I do uh, with the organization of Black Aerospace Professionals. Hold on, but could be, before you go to the OBAT, because I want to dive into OBAT, but I just want people to understand what you're saying. You said that in the 19, I guess, 40s, when you had the start of the Tuskegee uh, Airmen's uh, experience with the United States Air Force, that brought into, ushered in a, um, a, um, an era of um, you know, black pilots that led to, I guess, by the 1960s, um, an integration of at least 4% of the uh, pilot uh, cadre or the, uh, of all the pilots in the you know, United States Air Force were, were, were African-American airmen. And are you saying that that uh, percentage from 1960 through 2020, <laughs> 60 years later, has not changed? Is that what you're saying? Absolutely correct. Wow. Staggering. I know. Now, there was a spike, obviously, but now we're kind of going back into a lull in the sense that uh, SpaceX has come on. Uh, a lot of people are moving into coding, uh, moving away from the cockpit and doing other things. Uh, part of that, at least from the military appeal, uh, kind of deals with the commit level. So back in the old days, it was maybe six, seven years, but now it's kind of pushed to half of, of a retirement. So anywhere from 10 to 12 years. And, and so, but going back also to the question that I posed to you, where was it more um, challenging for you to graduate from pilot training as an African-American trainee than someone who was not an African-American trainee? It's challenging just to graduate from there. But when you start looking at the diverse candidate that graduates, it, it's even more so because uh, some are an island of one. Uh, without giving the number, I will tell you this. The same number of B-2 aircraft that we have is the same number of Black or African-American fighter pilots that we have. Now, and, and what is that? And what is that number? I just leave that one there from a, a security level, but I'm just saying you don't see too many B2s. So you, you see that few far as black fighter pilots. So then when you start looking at female, uh, it's even s s scarcer than that. So I say if you see a black pilot in the in the military, you've hit the lottery. If you see a black female pilot, you've hit the lottery like six times over. So, so tell me, so tell me, what, what did you have to do in order to make it through this rigorous and I guess even by your 
on a testing hostile work environment or hostile training environment? How did you make it through to become one of the few of the few um, black military pilots? Well, part of that was the mantra that we said, collaborate to graduate. So when you dispatch these teams, you already had a, a built-in support network. So you would quiz each other, uh, uh, you'd laugh at each other, uh, you cheer each other on. Uh, so that was the beauty as far as networking. Uh, the networking kind of, it, it just continued from the academy days and moved over to the pilot training days. So everybody that graduates, you know, went through that same uh, uh, process, uh, the same thing as you uh, were to graduate from the academy. Everybody shared similar experiences, no matter what your degree was, no matter where you came from, uh, everybody had commonality or common ground uh, with the achievement of getting that degree or getting your wings at the end from a pilot training perspective. Tell me, what, how was that experience, man? What, how did, I remember when I got my jump badge um, and my jump wings, by that time, all the um, black uh, trainees, all the black cadets minus one other, it was me and another brother who's, who I know, I think you probably will remember him, but I, I'm blanking on his name. We were the only two to survive that summer. Um, and I was, you know, I was elated because I had actually sprained my ankle. So I wasn't actually even supposed to, you know, again, um, you know, get uh, my wings because you, you couldn't hurt yourself during the, uh, the training. But I, I, I kind of, you know, uh, not I didn't disclose that injury. Uh, but it was a it was a wonderful experience. What um, how did you feel, man, when you finally you know, you got those wings and, and what did it, what did it mean, you know, to you and, and your buddies who helped you to kind of get through? It, it was awesome. Uh, I, great sense of accomplishment. Uh, one, I didn't know anybody from, from my neighborhood. We grew up in an agricultural neighborhood where it's farming or mechanics. Uh, so it, I did get some blowback from friends back home in the sense of going, you fly airplanes, I would never get on a plane with you because I know you. And so I said to them, well, when you travel, because I know that you said you hadn't traveled in a while, you get on the airplane, do you know the pilots up front? And they said, no. I said, so let me understand the logic. You feel comfortable flying with someone that you don't know than someone that you do know. So I guess the phobia is to get over the shtick of not seeing something that you normally see up front. So if you see a diverse member up front, uh, they're the same uh, quality, if not better or equal uh, than the person that does not look like them uh, because everybody's gone through rigorous trainings. Now, I'm not going to sugarcoat it and say that uh, everything is uh, rainbows and unicorns because it really isn't. As I said, there are several exit ramps throughout the training process, uh, medical, so you could break your leg, there you are delayed. Uh, you could uh, develop some type of, uh, 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 we call it duties not including flying DNIF uh, criteria, which takes your medical away. Uh, or you could lose interest uh, or get frustrated out. Uh, there are so many ways to get out of the program. But for those that last, uh, the reward is great. Uh, I. Uh, knock on wood, I, I'm just thrilled uh, of the opportunity that I had. And I try to share that with other folks because uh, it's just something that you don't see every day. So tell me um, about your experience um, in the Air Force. What um, planes did you fly and, and, and how were those uh, experiences and, and how did they lead you to the um, organization of black um, aerospace professionals? So uh, things worked well for me. I ended up flying the C-130, as I said. Uh, I went to uh, first base in Texas and I went to the schoolhouse, the formal training unit there in Little Rock. Uh, did exceptionally well there. And matter of fact, there were a couple of uh, 
I'm going kind of, as they say, brush your, brush your shoulders off. I ended up getting uh, the uh, AETC, which is the Air Education Training Command, Instructor Pilot of the Year for that year. Uh, so out of all the people uh, that were instructors, uh, regardless of what airplane you flew, uh, in AETC, uh, I was uh, the one at the top of the iceberg. So I came to a point where as, do I stay or do I go? Uh, and talking with some of the folks, and I just saw the uh, advantages I had leaving active duty at that point, going to a guard or reserve component and starting my civilian career. Uh, uh, and that's what I chose to do because it's a different subset Whereas military was mission oriented, uh, civilian or commercial is driven by the dollar. And uh, as I tell folks, they don't pay me for what I do. They pay me for what I know. Uh, and uh, when I say that, they know what they're gonna get, a person that's gonna get the mission done, but will do it safely, effectively, and efficiently. Uh, and that's the way I brief it. Uh, and that's the way we fly it. Uh, nothing should compromise safety and nothing should compromise your integrity. So let me ask you, and those are, those are values for both in the airplane or, or, or outside the airplane. And I appreciate you sharing that for our parents and our um, educators who are trying to train the next generation of, of, of pilots or aerospace professionals or STEM professionals. Um, have you uh, always been, you know, upon leaving the um, the Air Force, you said you went into the Air National Guard. Where, where were you stationed initially? Uh, Kentucky. I ended up, same platform. I, I ended up going to Kentucky and becoming uh, one of the instructors uh, there as well. And so flew that, uh, retired in 2014. Uh, and, and what was your did you what was your rank upon completing were your lieutenant colonel or colonel or major or general <laughs> i couldn't make it up to those uh surly mountain tops but i made it as lieutenant colonel uh excellent excellent and so um as i should have put on your title lieutenant colonel uh jeff harrison um but i know you are a pilot now i guess they call all pilots uh captains i guess in, in terms of um the, um, the in terms of the profession, but um, upon leaving the Air National Guard and, and getting into the commercial uh, side of the business, um, have you always been at the same uh, organization, or have you you moved organizations? So th that's that's funny that you should ask. So I didn't know too much about OBAP at the time. It, it when it started, when I was getting out, uh, it was called the Organization of Black Airline Pilots. So it was founded because in uh, 76, I believe the time frame was, uh, the folks were having a hard time getting into the airline industry. Uh, in unfair uh, hiring practices, uh, the whole nine, uh, even though they were super qualified. Uh, so they somewhat unionized, I'll call it like a unionized, but they made a, a group uh, to combat that, to synergize uh, uh, and leverage their experiences. Uh, to tell the industry that they are just as qualified, uh, just as capable, uh, but more uh, uh, more importantly, ready uh, to change the narrative. Uh, and thank goodness for that, because that's what we brought uh, brought out to today. So, uh, 2001, I switched over and I started uh, uh, my volunteer service work with the organization of Black Aerospace Professionals. Uh, it's but, but my question, I guess, in terms of your, um, your the com where you work, have you always been employed in the same uh, airline carrier, or have you moved around in terms of the different carriers? So, knock on wood again. Yes, sir. Uh, one job, uh, one career, uh, one dream. Uh, that's great uh, because there's so much volatility that you've probably seen with job cuts. Uh, from the passenger side, uh, really hasn't ebbed over into the uh, uh, cargo side uh, of things in the sense that uh, there are folks that have been furloughed, but they've been brought back to work. Uh, whereas 
uh, because people aren't flying uh, due to apprehension with the pandemic, uh, economic woes, uh, rollouts of different air, uh, platforms, uh, those setbacks, the public has dwindled as far as flying. Uh, hopefully we'll get back to a new normal uh, where folks will get back into the airline business uh, of, of travel uh, so that uh, those folks that were out job right now will find themselves gainfully employed. Well, and, and maybe you can now, this will probably be good to talk a little bit about the, um, you know, the, the career path as a pilot, both when you, um, got, um, you know, in to the business versus now. Um, I mean, there's you know, the kind of airline, the airline business and commercial travel has changed dramatically, especially through COVID. Uh, one of the things that you may know um, is that, um, you know, there's a big push for uh, autonomous vehicles, particularly even including um, autonomous air vehicles uh, before COVID. Um, how do you see the industry changing before your eyes uh, over the time that you've been in the, um, the, the, the business of, of uh, commercial uh, flying, which uh, can you, you know, share with us how long that's been? Well, uh, <laughs> One, I hope it doesn't change while I'm still employed. Uh, two, uh, it's 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 about the money. Uh, from a commercial standpoint, uh, they look at it as now here's a, a, a an item that probably won't take a sick day, an item that won't have to uh, pay a pension, or an item that uh, I'm wondering uh, how they're feeling that day because there are so many things that kind of go into. Uh, the construct of a crew. Uh, the negative side is uh, if it is autonomous uh, and you've seen cyber hacks, uh, how can you make sure that this thing is secure? Uh, in the sense, how do you develop public uh, confidence uh, in that it's in there? I say, not from a conspiracy standpoint, uh, but it's happening today. Uh, if you go through a busy airport, uh, you get on a train going from one terminal to the next, there's no longer a conductor up front. Uh, if if you've purchased a car that has uh, the driver awareness program, uh, it kind of keeps you in, in the lane. Uh, it can navigate from one point to the next. Uh, if you've purchased a small uh, drone uh, for enjoyment, if you're doing uh, landscaping uh, or just recreational flying, uh, they have those in other capacities. Uh, so when you think of it from a logistics standpoint, think about a, a busy metroplex like New York City, where it takes uh, forever to move from one building to another building five blocks uh, if you're going by vehicle, especially with the congestion of traffic. There in the DC area, I'm sure uh, pre-COVID, uh, traffic it just gets crazy when you start going across the bridge from uh, Maryland to Virginia. Uh, but if you can go, as they say, the crow flies, uh, that saves time. So when you start looking at uh, moving transplant uh, organs, if you start moving uh, sensitive uh, correspondence, uh, that's what the customer wants to pay for is time, uh, not necessarily for uh, a service or the people that they pay for, uh, the option of time. Uh, and that's where I think things are migrating. So as I teach folks to become pilots, I also teach them to uh, think about coding because if you want to be the triple threat, uh, kind of like the Jamie Foxx in the, because uh, uh, he can act, sing, play the piano uh, and tell a joke. Uh, if you want to be that kind of character in this industry, uh, you need to sharpen your your skills and not only fly the airplane, but know how to build it uh, and then the coding to talk to it. So now, and, and that's very interesting, um, you know, because my son, he's a, a uh, aspiring pilot. He, he likes to play um, 
I don't say play, but he just likes to fly simulators. So he, he would he would be mad if I said he likes to play simulator. He likes to fly simulators. He's all the thirteen. And he's flying some you know seven four seven you know uh, jet uh, uh, airline you know um, simulators with him flying into various airports around the world. You know, and it takes him hours. You know, each uh, flight almost like he's an actual you know pilot flying. A, a real life aircraft. So it's exciting. And even myself, I, um, after leaving the academy, I actually um, uh, went ahead and, and, and paid to take uh, and enroll in a, um, a flight training program here in, uh, in the Maryland area. Uh, it was actually a school that was founded by some Tuskegee Airmen. And, um, and I was, you know, able to to kind of clock uh, almost close to 40 hours, definitely over 20, and I, and I soloed a couple of times. And, and so it's exciting, the idea of, you know, basically flight and, and aerospace. But but again, as you call, you pointed out, it seems to me to be now more uh, looked upon, especially by those in, you know, uh, the corporate elites controlling the business, more kind of um, like pilots are nothing but a commodity that may soon be, you know, uh, excised out of the equation. And so for a, an aspiring young man like my, uh, my son is who aspires to become a, a pilot, uh, wh what are your recommendations for him? I mean, if he goes that route, what are you, what are you recommending? And, and tell me a little bit about the, the training academy that you all have. Uh, where you're actually training young young men like my son. Oh wow! Okay, so we're peeling off the layers of this onion. Is that what I'm saying? Exactly. So let me peel off some of the layers of the onion. So uh, pilot training or production will take place uh, from here. So you the actually literally peeling off. <laughs> <laughs> so I said. That was that side, now this is this side. So the whole thing is uh, pilot production will still continue because as long as they're building uh, manned uh, cockpit space, uh, there is gonna be a need. Uh, when you start seeing uh, that ebb away, uh, which I think will be years down the road, at least that's what I'm hoping for, uh, it'll be in there. But obviously public opinion is gonna sway that as well as big business as to where they want the bottom line with their dollar. So uh, uh, I would say if your son is interested in flying, by all means do this. Uh, it is best to transition uh, from one platform to the other because the principles, the principles will remain the same. Uh, the issue is what is the economy that's going to be driving it. Uh, I personally don't see uh, uh, a, a uh, a recess uh, in pilot production. We are at a shortage uh, as we speak. There are several opportunities that are out there. Uh, so one is uh, obviously where uh, I, I do the school, which is the uh, uh, organization Black Aerospace Professionals, Lieutenant Colonel Luke Weathers Flight Academy, which you kind of see in the background right there. Uh, we are based out of uh, Olive Branch, Mississippi, which is adjacent to Memphis. Uh, and uh, on, we, I, thought, I thought you guys have a, a partnership with Delaware State. Is that still uh, the case or are you, um, you you got a new partnership now? So it's a new partnership. So we had a partnership there in Dover, Delaware. I did that from about 2010 to 17. Uh, and then Delaware State uh, University, HBCU, uh, started going through, uh, I'll just call it a shift uh, as far as a focus as to what they wanted. Uh, and we were trying to expand, but uh, not at the same rate as Delaware State. So rather than uh, be uh, stagnant, we said, let's seize the moment uh, and create our own facility. Uh, and that's what we did as far as the Luke Weathers Flight Academy. So now you can get your ratings anywhere from private pilot, uh, private pilot's license all the way through uh, certified flight instructor, or a uh, multi-engine instructor. Uh, so how much does that cost the, uh, the pilot academy? Glad you was asked. So we don't publicize it because uh, it is a, but I will tell you this, it's a fraction 
of what you would pay at uh, any of your four-year institutions or at any of uh, the outfits that you see locally. Uh, the advantage that you get with us is, especially if you're of a diverse uh, uh, candidate, you're going to be instructed by someone that looks like you, uh, someone uh, that has or shares similar backgrounds as you. Uh, so that now it's not like the uh, the old days in the sense that uh, if, if I if I can see it, I can be it. Uh, and that's what we really do. So it's more than just teaching to become a pilot, but it's really teaching to become a leader. Cool, uh, Otto, but let me just get a clear understanding because you know, when my son hears this, he's gonna probably ask me to start you know, saving for him to uh, <laughs> enroll in this academy. And I, I guess my question is, is, is there, how will, you know, uh, I see the price tag once he goes to the website or is it on the website or is it not? On, on, do you have to get, you know, accepted into the program before you are actually told how much it costs or, or what is the, um, what is the process? If I, if yeah. I was in so uh, I'll just kind of give you this example uh, and it's a hypothetical. So if it were to cost you 150,000 to send your child through a four year institution uh, to get those same ratings, it will cost you uh, less than half of that uh, and then in a quarter of the time. So what happens is you have to understand that it is a business, uh, all this college, uh, professional training, it's all a business. So uh, you get a return on that investment the quicker you can get them into the slipstream of that investment. So on the career path, uh, I say that because uh, one of the slides you'll see, it says from uh, dreams to careers in the sense that uh, anybody, as I tell the folks, for the young students, anybody can have a job. A job is years one through five. Uh, you get paid on the low uh, uh, side of the totem pole and you work super hard. Uh, what you really want to do is get into your career path, whatever it's going to be, pilot, lawyer, judge, uh, male person, yeah, whatever the case, you want years 20 through 25, because now you've maximized your pay scale. Uh, and now you hope that you're at a point where, as, you, as they say, you're a shot caller, uh, you're not working those crazy hours, and you also get the weekends off. So can, can I ask you a question as you you, you ask um, you point out the again the idea of being a shot caller not just like a person who's a you know a line pilot if you will um, two questions one is how much money do you start off making as a, a pilot after graduating from your academy for example ah uh, so those are the bleak days because those uh, I'll call it beanies and weenies and uh, mac and cheese days uh, you're not going to be making a lot because you are on the low side of experience, on the low side of hours. John, so can you, I mean, break that down to me, you know, being okay, we so the instructors will get paid anywhere from 30 to $40 an hour. 30, $40, okay, that's not bad. 30, $40 an hour, uh, and your sorties will last anywhere from an hour to an hour and a half, uh, maybe two, three hours if, if you're doing dual. Uh, so but you're not, you're not working 40 hour um, shifts though, right? Or are you? Oh no, you, you're working probably even harder than that because you're doing segmented flying. Uh, so it's not your average uh, nine to five work day. Uh, some days you'll be early in the morning and then you'll go off until the, uh, you put the sun, uh, well, you put the moon to bed as well. Uh, obviously there are constraints that you got to FAR limits uh, as far as uh, how long you can fly, uh, what your duty day is and the pre-mission crew rest that you need for the next day. Uh, so those are the, I will call it the hustle years, uh, and the pay is bleak. But that's years one through five. That's the same thing you get if you worked at KFC, McDonald's, uh, or any of those fast food type restaurants. Uh, minimum wage. Uh, but you're not. I mean, you're much better than minimum wage. You're you're like ten times minimum wage, or or four times minimum wage as a pilot. So that's not that's not bad money at all. Well, no, let me ask you this. No, no sir, no sir. That's a fallacy. So what you have to keep in mind is. In order to get to that stage, you've already paid monies to get those ratings. So you're having to beat uh, 
the debt that you've already incurred, right. uh, well, as well as to keep a cost of living and to work at minimum wage in order to get competitive to be hired by a major. And when that happens, you need to amass uh, 1,500 hours, uh, typically 1,000 PIC is what they call a pilot in command. Uh, on, so let me, I, 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 am I hearing correct? You said you start off making minimum wage and then you work your way up to 40, 40 dollars an hour? Yes, sir. So uh, as they oh, say, wow, I missed that. They, no, no, as they say, you don't come on the job wearing the blue shirt. Sometimes you got to work fries, you got to flip burgers or whatever the case may be. And then you elevate to the person in the blue shirt. So uh, what I say is it's not years one through five because everybody goes through that. So here's part of that. Uh, uh, ritual that all the pilots go through because those are the days that you go like, uh, I don't know where they would talk about this milk and honey at the end of the rainbow with a pot of gold, but trust and believe there is a pot of gold. So uh, you go from minimum wage years one through five, typically to get to a competitive point, And then you become competitive to be hired by an airline. Uh, you go through another initiation, which is called probationary pay. Uh, and based upon what your contract uh, with that employer is, determines what your salary will be from that point on as a line pilot. Now, every airline has a different set of rules as far as how much you get paid in the first year, how much you get paid subsequent years. You can find most of that information at airlinepilotcentral.com. Airline yeah. Pilot if, you, if you Google that, it'll tell you exactly how much you make. But, so let me ask you another question. How about the track of being your own, you know, airline uh, or your own carrier company? How many black, um, you know, owned carrier companies or airline companies are there right now? Uh, off the hand, I couldn't tell you that, sir. Uh, I would venture to say uh, if there's any, it's less than on my hand. And so, the, and that's my question to you is like, how, if we now know that the picture is not as rosy for pilots, at least starting off, what is the pathway to get from becoming a pilot to becoming, a, um, you know, a, a CEO or an owner of a, um, a company that is in the airline business? Challenging question. Uh, it's a lot of variables that go in that. Uh, one is uh, capital. As they say, it takes money to make money, but it also takes opportunity. So uh, the issue is you're asking for uh, an in game solution when I really don't know what the inject is at the origin. Because <laughs> typically what happens is I meet the person too far downstream to say, if I only met you two, three years earlier, things could have been differently. But what I would tell you is, uh, from an airline perspective, I'll, I'll just do it this way, uh, and this is what I tell the students. Uh, you can go from uh, 20, I'll just say $26,000 before taxes when I started in my airline job. So when I got my check, uh, I think I was making more <laughs> as a second lieutenant than I was as an airline pilot. But that was a step back. Uh, but now, if you go on the airlinepilotcentral.com, uh, my pay could uh, be eight times that of, of that value. Now, uh, and, 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 and again, um, you know, one of our, our, our other colleagues, Colonel Tony Perkins, just said that there was a, a company called Jetted owned by Glenn Gonzalez. Uh, an Air Force Academy uh, graduate and a former um, fighter pilot who um, is uh, is out there, but it, it it it's from your understanding, it's 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 a you know you got to have capital in order to make those types of uh, moves. Um, is OBAP and let's talk a little bit about this OBAP in terms of its founding and and is it just for pilots or, or or is it for all kinds of people? And I, I see Michelle uh, Goodman says she attended an OBAP convention in Northern Virginia uh, and she had a great time. But tell me a little bit about OBAP. So OBAP, it original name was Black Airline Pilots. So what was getting lost in that shuffle was there are many other facets to the aerospace industry than just being a pilot. So we rebranded it uh, to 
Organization of Black Aerospace Professionals. So now you start looking at a pilot track, you look at an aviation maintenance track, you look at an air traffic controller specialist, you look at aerospace engineering, uh, you look at software design, you look at all the tentacles in which aerospace touches. Uh, and in that sense, you will get linked up with a mentor that is in that career field uh, through the Aerospace Professional Development Program. Uh, obviously, our bedrock was uh, developing pilots. Uh, so what we're doing at Luke Weathers is creating that same uh, origin or nucleus, if you will, uh, the birth of the galaxy, if I'll, I'll think of it that way, in the sense that of the Big Bang, you start with the pilots and then we'll move to aviation maintenance and then we'll move to uh, air traffic control specialists and then we'll move to uh, uh, the aerospace uh, uh, engineer. Uh, so those are platforms in which we're delving in, but there is not really a cohesive uh, group or organization solely from OBAP. So we'll outsource that to universities, we'll outsource that to our industry partners, uh, but from within OBAP, you can anticipate those same things being housed under one roof in the sense it'll be a one-stop shop. And so how many um, people um, are in that organization? Um, how much of the, the dues and um, you know, we would like to partner with OBAP ourselves as STEM for us, because I, I see a lot of synergy in terms of increasing the numbers of um, people in the STEM field, aer uh, aerospace being one uh, of the STEM fields. Um, who, who's the leadership of this organization right now? So the executive board down is being held up by a gentleman, uh, Joel Webley. Uh, and uh, that would be a question that he would have to address. Uh, from the board level. Uh, me, I am uh, not part of that main body, uh, but I am uh, close to uh, that. So if it were the octopus, uh, he'd be the, the head of that, and I'd be one of the tentacles that kind of come off there from Luke Weathers. Uh, so that question would be addressed to them. Well, obviously, there's synergy, and we partner with several of them. So if you go on the uh, website, obap.org, uh, you can see some of the industry partners that we have. One would be uh, Tuskegee Airmen. Uh, two would be Sisters of the Skies. Uh, three would be uh, Shades of Blue. Uh, four would be uh, uh, Negro Pilots of America, uh, which also is a sub subsidiary of the Black Pilot Association. Uh, so there are several things. So each person can do their own thing alone, but that's the word that you pulled out. And that's one of the things we kind of talk about uh, when we groom the folks that are becoming pilots, but they're really becoming leaders outside the cockpit uh, synergy. Whereas one plus one is not the conventional two, but it's really equal to three because what you bring and what I bring stand alone will equal two. But if we combine our efforts, uh, we come out with a product greater than we are singular. So one plus one equals three. Well, brother, this has been a, an amazing conversation. I want to uh, leave you with three questions I'd like to ask, uh, which I've been asking is, one, um, if you were talking to the, um, the young uh, Jeff Harrison of uh, back in, in 1990, 89, uh, when we were uh, students at the Air Force Academy, what would be your advice uh, to, to, to him? Second of all, what um, would what do you see yourself at the end of your career? Um, uh, what would you what would you like to you know accomplish before your career uh, ends? And lastly, you know what would you like to um, leave you know uh, to mankind? What would you like at the end of your life um, to have the almighty uh, account or write down uh, in your book of, of, of good deeds? What, what would you like the, the, the most the most important of those accomplishments to be? Wow, okay. So uh, let me go to my studious mode. Uh, so uh, the first thing is we kind of learned at the academy in the sense of setting goals. Uh, and that was a really good foundation. So one of the things is you want to be smart. 
when you start doing goals. Be specific. So figure out what it is that you want to do. Uh, find them as a measurable uh, standpoint. So track where you are from where you're beginning uh, to the end. Uh, three, you have to make them attainable. So be realistic when you're shooting for the goals. Uh, four, with the R, they have to be relevant. Uh, it kind of defines what your passion or your purpose is. Uh, and then five, to make the, the SMART, the S-M-A-R-T, time bound. So do that. So I always say it goes like this. Uh, you set goals for a lot of things. Like I want to lose weight, New Year's resolution. That's probably slanted toward me. Uh, or you want to be independently uh, uh, wealthy or at least financially stable. Uh, what are you doing today that will get you to where you're trying to go to? So I say it used to be the five P's, you know, proper planning prevents poor performance. But now I kind of go figure out what your passion is in life. So no matter what I do, I'm not working. I'm doing something, even if it was for free, I'd be willing to wake up out of bed because far too many times you hear somebody say, man, I hate I got to go to work. Me, I love when I go to work. Uh, two, come up with a plan to support that passion, uh, which kind of goes on that three. Uh, three, uh, I kind of say it goes with a split P uh, kind of thing in the sense that one, I got to surround myself with people uh, that'll be there, but I also have to be persuasive. Uh, it's bad enough for you to try to figure out what it is that you want to do, but it's infinitesimally difficult to have somebody invest in a dream that's not theirs, but yours. Uh, and then the, the last P would be a periodic look back. Uh, you take a physical before you uh, play sports. Uh, you check your teeth uh, several times. Heck, you even get your car checked out if you're going to buy a new car. But when's the last time you really take it, taking a look as to where you want to be uh, five years, 10 years, 20 years down the road? Uh, so that's the first thing that I would tell the younger self. Uh, the next thing you said, where do I see myself? Uh, well, I, I, I say alive. <laughs> I want to be alive. Uh, but I also want to be a uh, producer of talent, uh, a diverse talent that's out there. Because far too many times do we see uh, talented folks not be recognized or not be acknowledged or not be represented uh, at a higher level. Uh, and then uh, case in point, the young sister that just spoke yesterday, uh, outstanding, brilliant. Uh, so now uh, what I saw on the news was very uh, comforting because they're giving her love, which they should. Uh, but just as they give her love, uh, look at those other institutions because there are uh, many other folks that look just like her, speak just like her, but are not giving a platform. So uh, that's what I would like to see as far as that. And then when it comes to leaving a legacy, uh, I guess the legacy I will leave, uh, I want people to consider themselves to be uh, uh, keepers of ESP. So yeah, we think of ESP as extrasensory perception, but I want you, the student, to be an exceptional or abide by exceptional student protocol. So it goes with the five basic senses. The first one is vision of sight. What you see may not be a reality, may not be the reality. So uh, you've seen it on the side mirror, object in the mirror, uh, maybe uh, closer than, than what they seem. Uh, but the other thing is what others see in me could be a game changer. So if I'm wearing uh, saggy clothes, uh, tattoos, uh, uh, unkempt, uh, that could preclude an opportune uh, moment for me to find a new career path or become a CEO uh, to have that investment opportunity. So dress the part if you want to be the part. Uh, the next thing from that will be smell, as far as a sense. If that sound, if it smell, the joke goes, he that smelt it probably dealt it, right? Yeah, right. That's the joke that everybody kind of says. But there's kind of a truth in there in the sense that you have to be wary of being guilty due to proximity. 
So if you have a, a, a nucleus of people in there, uh, I don't know which one it is, but I'm gonna blame all y'all until I find out which one it is. So be cognizant of who you surround yourself with. Be cognizant of the environment that you find yourself trading in. Uh, and I say that from a personal and a professional relationship. Uh, touch, when it kind of deals with that, and since uh, touch kind of goes with equilibrium as well, uh, you have to be careful with this because sometimes they might have to lend on your services uh, if you touch somebody with a solar battery uh, or an advan uh, unwarranted advancements. So be careful. But I don't necessarily have to physically touch you to reach you. Right. Uh, much like my sister did yesterday with the poem. That's uh, true. That's true. She was that was a powerful, powerful point. And in fact, your words have reached so many um, Jeff, I'll tell I can tell you, man, that the content that you share with us tonight, man, has been um, like those uh, Britannica uh, encyclopedias that you mentioned uh, your your parents having purchased. And I know my parents um, may the almighty uh, have mercy upon them both. Um, I really appreciate uh, and I can say this on behalf of the entire uh, community of parents and um, educators that are connected to us at STEM for us, um, which numbers around 14,000. We really appreciate hearing your story. And and I really think that we could have gotten more, you know, we could have gotten into some of your more, most harrowing, you know, experiences as a pilot, you know, um, and what that training was like, you could have gotten into the, the C-130 aircraft that you uh, flew in the Air Force and, the, and you know, talk to more about the aircraft that you're flying now, but, and, and maybe some of the most exotic places that you, uh, you know, probably flew to. All those would have been questions I would have liked to have gotten to, but, you know, we only have an, an hour and we've actually already gone over uh, about 15 minutes. So, <laughs> um, but what I do want to say to you, brother, is this, I'm, grateful and what that last point you mentioned in terms of you know the people that you surround yourself with i i am just so uh exceptionally grateful that the almighty blessed me to have been uh around you know uh you know, really talented and dynamic and brilliant uh people like yourself man i i remember my days at the academy i what stood out to me man was not your skill as a as a, a pilot because uh, i didn't even know you I uh, had uh, taken, um, you know, the glider uh, training and um, it didn't, you know, stand out to me that you were just so articulate and, and you know, and wise, man. What stood out to me was that you were just a cool, you know, cat, man, who always was composed. You know what I mean? Uh, almost like, uh, and I guess that's the you know, I, I should have imagined that, that, you know, that would have eventually led you to be successful as a pilot uh, because you need that type of composure, man. But you you always stood out to me as somebody who was uh, together. And, um, and, and, and so it's no wonder that you've been so successful. I really look forward to us working together, brother, and winning together and partnering with the Luke um, Weathers. And it's interesting that you mentioned Luke Weathers. Then there's a a family, a Weathers family, very famous uh, Weathers family from Memphis, Tennessee, where um, my uh, father was born and raised. And we have relatives in um, in Olive Branch, uh, Mississippi as well. So wow. I look forward to, to working with you and, and all the great things that you're doing, brother. Um, and I just want you to know on behalf of STEM for us, we appreciate you taking a bit of your time and also um, some of your finances to become uh, a STEM for us partner. We invite all the, the people who are listening to us, if you are interested in, in becoming one of our next uh, interviewees and our next special guests, if you have a story to share, please become a partner of STEM for us. We need your partnership and we need your stories. And our young people, particularly now, uh, as they experience COVID, they need to be uplifted. And we pray that these words will uplift uh, Jeff Harrison, we appreciate you, brother. Iron shop and Zara. Indeed, indeed. Roger out. Take care now.